Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm so excited for today's episode, which is on the importance of mindfulness in public schools. And my guest is Amy Tompton. Amy has been an academic education, educator in the public school system for 24 years. This to this year marks her 21st year working for Denver Public Schools. She currently holds the position at West High School as their student support coordinator and specifically their social emotional learning lead. Amy brings yoga and mindfulness into the classroom to support their social and emotional learning. She's also completed her 200 yoga teacher training with Breath for Change, 200 hour yoga teacher training with Breath for Change and her children's yoga teacher training with the amazing women of Kids Yoga Guide, Yogi Full and Yoga Hive. Sharing mindfulness and yoga practices with those that may not traditionally have these opportunities is her passion. Welcome, Amy. It's so great to have Thank you. Thank you here. so much, Wendy. So nice to be here with you. Absolutely. So I read you her bio and I've I uh I've known Amy now for about 26, almost 27 years. And she was one of my very first friends when I moved to Colorado. We were working in a coffee shop together. <laughs> and so that's how we initially met. And I've I've watched Amy over the years. I've known her as an academic educator in the public school system. And then she's been making this transition to mindfulness and really um, positively impacting the, the education environment here in her, in her school. And I would love to know a bit more, Amy, about what, what was that for you? What was your transition into teaching mindfulness in public schools? Or your yeah, purpose. yeah. Thank you. And thanks for having me, Wendy. It's so fun to be here talking with you about all this. Um, yeah, so I've been in public education for such a long time and really spent a lot of my career focused on academic strategies. I was an instructional dean. I coached teachers. And I just, as the years went on, I kept seeing over and over again how there was this like deeper level, like by just pushing academics and strategies. And we were kind of, I felt like I wasn't necessarily doing service to the kids because I feel like there's so much more to being a successful person in life. And if you really want to be successful and find your own path there, you know, there's all those elements of self-awareness and knowing yourself and having coping mechanisms when things get stressful and all those pieces. And I saw our students struggling so much with those pieces that it was really, it felt like the base level, like we've got to do this before they can access, you know, these academics. So I really felt like rather than continue to throw academics at them, I wanted to step back in my career and see how I could support this movement to, you know, really provide students all the other things they need in their life to be successful. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, kind of gradually evolved over, over time in my mind. And I've always loved yoga. I've been practicing yoga, I don't know, since I was in my 20s, off and on, and then had this opportunity to go to my 200 hour change, a 200 hour program with Breathe for Change, which is a yoga teacher training program specifically designed for educators. So it's a really exciting movement to get more teachers, social workers, counselors, educators involved in sharing all these practices, yoga and mindfulness. So that was a really transformative experience for me. And I built a beautiful community. And so then, then yoga and mindfulness just so seamlessly began to integrate with the work I was doing in schools. And I'm also very fortunate to have an amazing boss. Um, my, my principal, Mia Martinez Lopez, she also practices mindfulness and yoga and is just a big believer in that in her life and understands the importance for our students. So she has really been instrumental in letting me experiment and try things and kind of grow our school into this new this new place where we're at now. 
So that's so kind fantastic. of how I found myself here with my dream job. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, there's uh, you know, I we I'm in the field of personal growth education or uh, intuitive development type of education and such. And so there's such a we hear the term mindfulness. And those who might be listening might be familiar with the term mindfulness, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering from your perspective, what, how would you define mindfulness? In, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, I think for me, I just think of it as practicing that present moment awareness, um, just taking that pause. And, and I really do think it's a practice it can be so difficult, but practicing the pause, the awareness, the noticing, noticing without judgment, and just really giving ourselves that moment of peace, no matter what's like going on around us, that we can take that pause for ourselves and be present in the moment. So, so that's how I think of it. Um, I also try to paint a pretty broad picture of it for students so that it feels accessible to them. Like maybe you feel really in the moment when you're taking a jog or when you're doing something creative like coloring or drawing. Um, you know, there's all kinds of ways to really feel that peace in the moment. So I want them to have different access points to that. Uh, although when I can get them to sit still for a minute, I think there's such a power in stillness and it is um, not something our society promotes very often, <laughs> just yeah. being still. So, you know, maybe playing soccer is their entry point, but how can I help them see that being still, they could maybe have that same feeling of calm and presence and joy. So, so we, we talk a lot about those things. Um, I also think in the work I do, it's critical with uh, all the social justice work we're trying to do in my school and the movement, you know, just in our country with trying to fight racism and to all personally trying to become anti-racist without that awareness and that pause, like, wait, why am I feeling angry right now or uncomfortable? It, it's gonna be really hard for us to move forward personally or as a country with all the social justice work that needs to happen. So that's that's another important link for me personally and for the work I do at schools. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, even that awareness of um, giving and providing the opportunity, I imagine for some respite in, you know, it, I mean, one of the things I read in your bio was that there, you know, you're providing this opportunity for, people who might not necessarily have these tools and to be able to build that within the structure of the school to be able to say, okay, there is, there is this place of connecting to yourself, you know, in your body, yes. in this space, whether we're, you know, in, in, um, you know, a multicultural environment and whether we're in, you know, just mixed race that we're in this space of being able to do this work together mm -hmm. in, a, in a school. Yeah. Yeah. It can powerful. be really powerful. I am curious. I mean, if you could even describe what a child's experience might be that, you know, what, I guess my question is how do, did the pandemic specifically, how did that affect what, did you notice a difference between how children, how students were pre pandemic during the pandemic mm -hmm. You know, and how was mindfulness tools able to support them if during yeah. or post pandemic? Yeah, well, um, you know, there mental health was really, really deteriorating with adolescents. There were a lot of red flags already prior to the pandemic, and then the pandemic kind of just exasper exacerbated all of those things we were already seeing with our children and adolescents with mental health and, you know, the isolation in addition to the racism in our country and all the flare up of social and political unrest, like all of that was kind of the perfect storm for really making this problem uh, a lot worse. I guess the good news is it brought it into the light um, recently, I think it was in May of 2021, the 
Children's Hospital Association, along with a few other, the major like Adolescent Psychology Association, they all came together and declared a state of mental health emergency for our children and adolescents. So that, you know, that's a pretty critical moment when all these huge national organizations come together and go, no, look, we have to pay attention. Like this is a national emergency. So what, what I have seen is just that loneliness. I mean, what we hear over and over again from our students in the surveys is just, they, they want to be connected. And to some degree, they, they don't know how anymore. They've lost a bit of that ability. You know, they got a bit, a bit stuck, I think, in the pandemic. You know, we have 11th graders, you know, who haven't been in school since the beginning of their ninth grade year. Well, typically ninth graders and 11th graders are really different maturity wise, but they're not anymore. So, you know, they still want to play and they want to play games and they want to play outside and they want to connect because they had missed all that. So I think the connection piece is huge. I also think an alarming thing I've noticed is how dependent on their phones they've become. Their phones, I think, became their main coping mechanism while they were in isolation and while they were in the pandemic, you know, and, and I think that happened for a lot of us, honestly, so I can relate, but I think for our kids, it was like, this is my only connection now to friends, to outside world. And, you know, it's kind of like their teddy bear and now they're afraid to give it up. So, so that, I mean, that is something I consider a huge success when I can get a whole class to put down their phone and put it away for 15 minutes even, because that is scary. It's honestly scary for them. They've become so dependent on it. So that's that's a real problem that, that we've seen a lot um, coming back. Uh, so those are two of the main things. I also just think, you know, it's a stressful time. High schoolers have a lot of stress in their life. And I was seeing for years how super stressed they are. And I think that has only increased, maybe the stress increasing with the ability to cope decreasing a little has caused some real problems uh, for them as well. And then, you know, maybe it's with the phone connection, just that con constant bombardment of information. And I just think we've ramped that up consistently over the years, right? Where it's just, like we are getting a constant feed of information and that can be hard for us as adults, but we have a few more tools to deal with that. So as a, you know, as a preteen or a teenager, like they don't have all the tools yet just cognitively to, to process all that input. So I, I do think that's where mindfulness can make them realize like they have that power. They have the power to shut out the input for a minute and like give themselves a moment of peace. And I, I think it's very empowering for them, honestly, to kind of take, take that back and own that as, as something that's within their capabilities. So yeah, so it's, it's a lot going on. There's a lot, a lot happening right now. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting, the, the, I mean, I love what you're sharing and the phone connection. I mean, it's a, it's almost like a self-soothing tool. Like if you were yes. in trauma, if you were in survival and safety, the world was mm -hmm. in fear, you need your attachment toy, you know, yes. to, to yes. self-soothe. And then you've got teenagers who all, you know, anyone up to the age of 25 is still, the brain is still developing, uh, you know, and, so yes. then, and then every time you look at the screen, there's you know, dopamine, dopamine developing in the, you know, it's, it's like a shot of dopamine to the brain. And right. so, there, so there is a, 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 you know, a brain chemistry component that's happening, but mm -hmm. then, but I love that you're, you're providing other ways to self-soothe, Yeah. you know, and that's, a, that's a, that's a training it's imprinting in the nervous system of their mm -hmm. being to be able to have these tools that are self-soothing and decompressing to the nervous system and the, our nervous system records information. So right. I, I can only imagine down the line as they're, you know, whatever it is, they're, they're graduated, they're often, they're working jobs, they're, they eventually become parents, things like that, that they have moments yeah. of uh, um, that, that's those self-soothing connection to themselves tools have been implemented 
Yeah. That's yeah. That's, powerful. and we try to talk about those things a lot. Like, well, how would you use this in your real life? How might this be helpful and make those connections for them for, for how they could use it. And, and sometimes kids, you know, they're not comfortable. They don't engage. And, you know, I'm always, I always just try to be really okay with that and think there may be a time five years from now when they get this super stressful job and they're panicked and they're like, it just comes back to them. And they're like, oh yeah, I remember all those things Miss T was saying. Maybe I should try that deep breathing right now. Like, yeah. I think, you know, even if a little bit gets in there and, and at a later time they need it, even if they seem like they're sleeping on the floor, it's all good, you know, like a little bit might get in that might help them down the road. So I'm always kind of about the slow drip method. Like just like baby step, like for so many of them, this is super weird. This is super new. And, you know, you don't want to look uncool in front of your friends. We all remember that feeling. Yep. And, um, and I think especially now, because they've kind of forgotten to, how to be around each other. So there, there's a lot of that barrier to, you know, kids feeling like, oh, are other people going to do this? Are they not? And, and just kind of being okay with that. Like, it's okay you don't want to do it today, no big deal. And then thinking, but a little bit's getting in there. Like they're, yeah, they're going to retain it. It also, even by giving them permission to not be forced into it on a sort of, re it's not necessarily reverse psychology, but it's in this form of, um, it develops trust. You know, yes. when you're saying I, I, you know, I'm not pressuring you to do this. There is this sense of, oh, I can be okay. And I can be myself or what I need in your presence and you're okay with that. Yeah. That's trust building. In yes. Many ways. Yeah. And it's so critical to create that safe space. And that's kind of a transition I've had to make. I mean, I always believed in making a safe space as a teacher, mm -hmm. but it's even more critical uh, that, you know, I'm never going to force anyone to do anything. I always tell them that. And I always give them lots of options, you know, and, and then what I've learned is, you know, you tell an adult yoga class or meditation class, listen to your body, do what you need. But they, you know, the adults are all going to do what you tell them to do. Whereas the kids, they really do. Like they'll lay down and go to sleep if they, if they're, and I'm like, well, your body needed to fall asleep. It's all good. Or, you know, they, they needed to lay on their stomach. Okay. Lay on your stomach. That's fine. You know, and I, I try to provide some little areas with mindful coloring and calm bottles. And if you know, if I see kids fidgeting, then I'll just hand them a calm bottle as an option. And I, I think they start to realize like a little bit of trust of themselves. Like, oh, she trusts me to do what I need for my body. And then like, I really, I went and colored and that felt good to me or it didn't. And I came back or you know, I laid on my stomach and that felt good. And she didn't tell me to sit up. And, you know, I think it's that not only trusting me and having it be a safe space, but starting to trust and listen to themselves, which I know can be so hard for all of us as adults too. Yeah. Yeah. That's so powerful. I, I wanted mm -hmm. to, I wanted to ask, like, start to talk a bit about the tools of mindfulness and what you might, what are, practices that you might offer your students. I, and, and I have a specific one. I, you know, I, again, as a, as an, a, working with adults, I mm -hmm. often will hear from adults. Um, well, I can't visualize anymore, you know, I, or I never could, I'm not good at visualizing. If you mm -hmm. tell me to close my eyes and you know, tune into a picture, an image, I don't see, maybe I feel more, I get the sense of knowing. And I was just curious, you know, specifically on the topic of visualization, yeah. you use it. And I imagine it's visualization, breath, and I'm sort of wondering mm -hmm. if you could break down for us, what types of tools you bring into the yeah. classroom? Yeah, of course. Well, we usually uh, just start with like some checking in and slowing down, just building that awareness again. And then we work on a breath tool. And I think for a lot of students, 
you know, they're like, what do you mean? I already breathe. And we talk about how most of the time we breathe up here and we, we practice some different strategies for really feeling what that feels like to breathe in your diaphragm because that's very new for so many of them. So we, we do some practice with breath work. And then um, I usually do some type of either a visualization or a meditation. Uh, they actually tend to really like the visualizations. Uh, I think kids are naturally pretty good at that. And I also try to make it like, if, you, if the visualization didn't work for you today, that's okay. Like, you know, that no pressure situation, you, you know, don't be hard on yourself. It, this could be the, this tool maybe isn't for you. You know, I'm always telling them to just try it on, try on the tool. Do you like it? You know, I know I'll go to a meditation class. And one thing I really like, I'm like, definitely going to use that. And then the other thing I'm like, that didn't work for me. So I want them to feel that same sort of comfort with like, oh, well, that one didn't work. Maybe the one next week will work better for me. So I try to make it really low pressure. The other thing, you know, with visualization, with visualization is um, I think it takes practicing that muscle, flexing that muscle a little. So I hope that gives them that opportunity to keep flexing that muscle that most of us were pretty good at when we were little kids. And I try to support them with walking them through different like sensory cues that like if they do tap into feeling more or they do tap into seeing more like that there's going to be one of their senses that helps them as an avenue to that visualization. So that I think sometimes that works and, and sometimes it doesn't work for them. That's that's OK, too. And then another thing I like to do is in the, in the opening, I'll have them maybe give themselves a number or a word. Um, I, I tend to like the number because they're very reluctant to share. They're very shy, but they'll sometimes hold up their fingers. So I say on a scale of one to 10, now that you've checked in, you know, one is like a bad day. 10 is you feel amazing. What number kind of pops into your mind? And a lot of them will then hold up your fingers and, and, yeah. and then it can give me a read on the room and it lets me know they're really like taking that moment to check in. And then I try to do it again at the end of class. And what 99% of the time, they all notice that their number went up and that they feel better at the end of class. And I think that's important for them to realize like, oh, maybe I wouldn't have thought about it, but it, I really do feel better now. Like that, that really did have some positive effect on me because I'm walking out of here feeling better than when I walked in. So, so that's kind of the flow. And, and sometimes there's only time for like a little piece of that. We'll just do one little quick breathing technique, you know, if we have five minutes and and so I, I take any time I can get. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so great. I would love for you to give us a, a demonstration of, you know, sure. what maybe a, a mindful practice or two, depending on, on, you know, what you have to offer. But before sure. we go there, I am curious if you want to speak to what you've noticed in mm -hmm. how, in how mindfulness might impact their, in a, maybe a positive way or how it might um, enhance their success in their education. Have you mm. noticed that, uh, how does it affect the, them in school and their performance as a student or maybe just in themselves as a human being? Just wondering. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, it's such a personal practice. It is so hard to get that kind of data. And, you know, education, we love things to be quantifiable. So it, it is a little tricky. But uh, I will say last year in the heart of the pandemic, when everything was remote, I sent out a survey and I think it was 80% of our students said they were using the strategies I was teaching them outside in their real life. Wow. And oh, so I thought, chills. I know it, it made yeah. me cry. So yeah. <laughs> I was like, it's all worth it. Yeah. So yeah, that I thought was really powerful that they were actually trying those and applying them in their real life. Um, this year, what I'm seeing is just more and more kids coming to my room, like, oh, we want to come to mindfulness class again. When can I do yoga with you again? What, you know, just this growing interest level in, in what's going on. And once they come, they want to come again. They like it. 
And, and sometimes it's hard. And I think that opens up questions too. I've had teachers say, well, so-and-so was nervous to come back because it made her cry the first time. And, and kind of just that opening up that avenue, like, that's okay. Like, it's okay to feel your feelings and cry and then making it somehow a safe space for them to come back to still. So I just think it's opening up these conversations. Uh, I see the kids being more open-minded and, and I, I see a level of kindness. I know, again, totally not quantifiable, but there's a level of kindness I'm seeing this year with people sticking up random sticky notes and you know, classes supporting each other. And we really have a very low rate at my school of bullying and fighting and that sort of thing already. But the surveys we're sending out, um, like in the 90%, our students feel safe at school. And, and we're an inner city public school. And, you know, a lot of our students come from a lot of trauma and that 90% of them feel safe over 90% of them feel connected to an adult at school. Um, I think that's really powerful. And a lot of that just speaks to the amazing work of our teachers, but I feel like the mindfulness like just helps build that culture where we can create that. So, and as far as education in general, I think this is such a critical question right now, Wendy, because we're in this time where there's this talk of loss of learning, right? Oh, the pandemic, there was this loss of learning. Everyone's behind, we gotta like hit it hard. But I think the danger of that is people can say, well, there's not time for anything but academics because the kids are behind. But what we know now through the brain research and through, uh, culturally responsive teaching research is that if we don't take the time to do these types of social emotional things where kids feel safe, connected, seen, heard, they have the coping mechanisms, without all that, they cannot tap into the learning to the best of their ability. So the secret weapon is the social emotional learning and these mindfulness practices. So I think we've got to come around if we really value, you know, high level academic education we, for everyone, we've got to come around to understanding this, this is a secret sauce right here. And without it, we're not going to get there. So I uh, chills. I continue to have chills as you're talking because even in, in trauma healing, they, the, the concept that you do, you can only go as far as your, your, and your nervous system feels safe to go. And, yes. and you can't progress even in your healing process or the frontal lobe doesn't fire or different aspects of our brain don't work. If we can't right. progress, if we're, if we're just at safety and survival, you know, for mm -hmm. children to move to thriving or to creativity or to their learning. It is, it's yes. moving students out of the state of, of, uh, an unsafety trauma fight, flight, or freeze or whatever exactly. might be going on, even in their mm -hmm. vagus nerve, you know, yes. whatever might be going on. And so I, uh, yes. And I, it so speaks to why the importance of social and emotional learning in school, mm -hmm. why, why it's necessary. It's really moving students past trauma in a way right. so that they can move. I mean, that's my language. I don't know that that's the school no, language, it's, but that's. You know, it's absolutely yeah. true. And, and we're working more and more, I know in our district, and I think in most districts to be more trauma informed, we have so many students with backgrounds in trauma. And now we've layered on this additional trauma that we all have faced collectively through the pandemic uh, that has added on this additional layer or exacerbated old traumas. So unless we're taking this trauma-informed lens, just like you said, I mean, all the science is there now. So it's really hard to argue against these practices when we, we know they work. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Um, <laughs> so would you like to take us through? Yeah. Practice? I would love to. I would love to. So I'll just uh, lead us through this and we'll just do a couple that I know my students really like. I'll, I'll, I'll just help us settle in. I need a little arm ramp, so I'm scooting over here. Um, I'll start with helping us settle in and then we'll do a breathing practice that uh, I know younger children usually really love. Um, 
I still really love it. And then we'll go into kind of a universally loved, I hear all the time from students as well as uh, teachers, <laughs> as well as teachers that this is their favorite one. So I'll end with that one. So uh, yeah, I would just invite everyone to maybe notice if your shoulders are up by your ears, if you need a few shoulder rolls, just let your shoulders soften and feel your feet connected to the floor. Feel your hands heavy on your legs and just go ahead and take that soft gaze down or close your eyes if you're comfortable with that. And just allow yourself to come to this present moment. Let go of your worries from earlier in the day and just begin to tune into your breath. As it flows in and out of your body, no need to change it. Just notice if perhaps your chest is rising and falling. Perhaps there's a little movement in your stomach. And then allow your attention to turn to your body. Notice how it's feeling right now. Any sensations, any pain, just send a little breath that direction. And then turn your attention to your mind. Notice if your mind is busy, busy, busy today, or maybe it's a little sleepy. And then turning our attention to our heart, to our emotions. Maybe seeing if you can label one or two feelings that you're feeling right now. And remembering there's no right or wrong all our feelings are valid. We're just going to notice them. And then I'll allow you to move into a check-in. So on a number of scale from one to 10, one being not doing so great, 10 being you're feeling amazing, what is your number right now at this moment? And knowing there's no good number, or bad number, it's just how you are right now. And this could change at any time. And we're gonna tune back into that breath. So everyone put a hand on our stomach if that feels comfortable to you. And we're going to take three deep collective breaths. And as you breathe in, just feel your stomach press out into your hand to get that nice big belly breath. So we'll take a big inhale in, nice and slow. Feel our stomach expand and our chest rise. We'll pause at the top and we'll exhale out. Inhaling in again. Pause and exhaling out. One more deep breath, make it your biggest breath of the day. Slowly letting it all out. Then we're going to add a little movement to these deep breaths. So on our next big inhale, we'll swoop our arms overhead forming a rainbow with our arms, reaching for the sky, then putting our palms together, opening our mouth, <sighs> exhaling our hands down for ocean breath. Let's do another one of those. Inhale, rainbow arms, stretch for the sky, ocean breath. <sighs> and go ahead and do one more on your own. And then just taking a moment to let your breath return to normal, checking in, noticing if there's been any change, any shift after those deep breaths. If not, that's okay. We're just checking in. 
And then we'll end our practice today with one of my favorites, up and down the mountain. So you need your hand and your finger for this. And if you wanna be subtle, you're always welcome to have your hand resting on your leg or anywhere it's comfortable. I'll just keep my hand up so you can see how to do this. And if you like to have your hand up too, that is great. And as we inhale, you can do it along with me. We'll inhale to trace up the mountain, pausing at the top of the mountain, exhale down the mountain. Breathing in, up the mountain, pause, breathing out down the mountain. Inhale, feel that stomach rise, that chest rise, exhale. Inhale, and exhale. One final deep breath here. Let it all out. Your hands can come back to your legs and just take one final check-in. Maybe letting a number float to your mind again on a scale of one to 10 and noticing if your number is the same or if it's higher, just checking in to see. And when you're ready, we can all come back together. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for breathing with me. Thanks, Wendy. Hey, thank you so much. That was so powerful. I love that. And I'm just going to reiterate for any listeners who might not see this visually, but that concept of bringing your finger up to the point of the, of the digit, the finger, and, and pausing there and then coming back down the other side. It's, that was such a, that was a, that was such a powerful tool. You know, I think in all my years of working as a, you know, in, in breath and healing work, I had not seen that. That was very cool. Yeah. Yes, that one is always a very, very popular. Um, you know, I find that a lot of the tactile ones are really powerful with square breath that they can trace a square on their leg or on their desk, breathing in to go up the square, holding the breath across the square, exhaling down, holding at the bottom. So that has a nice tactile element. Sometimes we just tap the breaths on our fingers. So we tap our thumb to our fingers to breathe in three. And the students really seem to like that kind of a tactile connection to the breath. And I think it helps them get a little more into the moment uh, as well. So that practice was a little longer too. And I think, you know, what I've realized, cause I love to do this, I could do it all day. A lot of times with students, with children, it's, it's starting really small is also critical to it being successful like maybe just that one up and down the mountain, like that would probably be enough to start or just, you know, the three ocean, three rainbow arm ocean breath, uh, you know, keeping it really small, bite-sized, accessible for children at the beginning, uh, because this is so new and it, it takes an attention span uh, that it, it's just really different for them. So I think uh, one thing I've learned the hard way is like making it too long and asking too much of them at the beginning and that I've had a lot more success with just little bits. And even if I want to have a longer session, then we'll stop and we'll talk about it or we'll build in some movement. Um, so that that's just a little a little bit of learning I thought I should share as well. Yeah, I love that. And like I was the um, I've seen the box. The, uh, we've, I've worked with the breath cycle with the box and the, mm -hmm. thing, but the hand is so it, it uh, you know, the, I can do it with my daughter. It's like, it feels like yeah. it's such a visual to work with for younger kids, mm -hmm. like you're saying, but I love that <clears throat> awareness of you only do a little bit, just give them a little bit. And yeah, see how they do with yeah, just a little bit at a time. And I've also found, particularly with my own children, that you know, if we can practice those things at a happy time, 
you know, just for fun or on the way to school or before bedtime, that that gives them an opportunity to like start to build those pathways and start to make that a habit. And I mean, I think it's twofold with mindfulness. Hopefully the more they practice those things or more we do as humans, the less we'll need them in a panic crisis situation. But I think they're also more of an ingrained habit and they're more accessible to us when we do need to call on them in when we're having a difficult moment. So I think that's the other thing that I've learned the hard way is not to try to introduce any of these things in the midst of crisis. panic or crisis, <laughs> yeah, does but, not go well. <laughs> then they have a positive association. They have more of a yes. joy or a different feeling mm -hmm. connected. Yeah, yeah. It's easier to try something new when you're in a good space. I mean, we all know that, and then then they have it at their disposal when they need it. So, yeah. 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 Oh, Amy, thank you. This was so powerful. Is there anything else you would like to share? No, I mean, this it's just been so fun. I really have enjoyed this time sharing my passion. And, you know, I could talk about this all day long. And I, I continue to be a learner in so many ways in this, you know, in this work. And, you know, I just, uh, yeah, I just appreciate this time to be able to articulate every time I articulate it, it helps me grow as well as a learner and a teacher. So I, I really appreciated this conversation and this chance to share my passion. Absolutely. And I appreciate also just hearing the model that's working in a school because I imagine, I know, we know there are so many schools in the, you know, in the country that, you know, it could, are, are struggling maybe because there isn't the budget or, because yeah. of whatever it might be on the on the district level or you know even with, mm. each, with whether they have enough teachers even to show up and and that there is a model that's working in the school mm -hmm. and you're seeing the benefits yeah the it's yeah it, it is it's it's difficult in education right now and um you know and and this work is not without uh resistance you know for some people they still find this work kind of scary, kind of out of their, out of their comfort zone, out of their element. So it's a slow process of winning people over <laughs> one at a time, helping them experience it. And again, have a positive association with it so that they want to practice it and share it. So it is, it is slow work and very, um, has to happen on a very individual basis, but there are a lot of tools out there right now in education. So I think it's a, it's a really good time um, to start this work because there are so many, so many ways to tap in, even if this is new to you or you wouldn't know how to begin to lead this, the resources are, are certainly out there. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amy. And, and just for anyone listening again, Amy is uh, a, is the student support coordinator at West High School in Denver. She focuses on social, emo uh, so excuse me, social emotional learning. She is the lead and she brings mindfulness to West High School and to her students in, in the school. Amy, thank you so much for being here. Thank you Got so you much, again. Wendy. Always nice hanging out with you. You too, Amy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.